in Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 through 11. We're going to be talking about the first five bold judgments. But I want you to realize that uh, these judgments are crescendoing. The seal tr- judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bold judgments, they are reaching their zenith with the bold judgments. And uh, this is where God is going to pour out all of his wrath on earth. There's no chances left for humanity on earth. Everyone has made their decision for Christ or not for Christ. And it really is kind of a sad time, but it is also a glorious time because Jesus is taking back planet Earth. And we're going to be studying that this week. And I'm trying to determine next week, I think I'm going to do the campaign of Armageddon next week. Uh, it, the, the, the six bold judgment kind of speaks to that. And I'm trying to decide whether I'm going to do that or just finish out the chapter and then do Armageddon separately later because this kind of segues into Armageddon. And I want you to remember, it's the campaign of Armageddon. It, there's about seven steps that take place in this campaign, and it's quite interesting. So we might be doing that next week, so stay tuned. But if you would, re- please stand for reading of the Word of God, starting in chapter 16, verses 1 through 11. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and the Foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood as as of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water and there became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be because you have judged these things for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pains. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. This is the word of God. Father, we thank you for your word, and thank you for how it is really informing us of how this whole thing is going to end. We don't have to be in fear. We don't have to walk in in any anxiety or worry. You've unraveled your plan for the future. And we know that Jesus wins that Jesus comes back, that Jesus will set up his kingdom, and all who will believe in him have received Jesus Christ as their Savior will be part of that kingdom. Thank you for the privilege of serving you in your kingdom in the future. Lord, it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be terrific. And that will indeed be our greatest day. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Now, when you think of the bold judgments... It just kind of sends a shiver up your spine because if you've been in the teachings, you know that this thing again is crescendoing. This is going to be focused on the earth dwellers and the Antichrist and his whole system. It's going to be violent, it's going to be bloody, and it will be quite rapid as Jesus takes back planet earth to come and reign as king of kings. Remember, it's the fulfillment of the theme of Revelation. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming in judgment. And Jesus is coming to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now last week we talked about God's final wrath. And it was a prelude to the bold judgments. The seven angels come out of the the temple of God with the seven bowls of wrath. And remember this, no believer will experience the wrath of God. Somehow he's going to sequester them out of the way of this wrath. If you notice the first one here, which we'll get to in just a second, they get these sores but it's only on the unbelievers, only on the earth dwellers. In chapter 15, we saw those who overcame the beast, and they were pictured on the sea of glass, the sea of glass. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but remember there was this area in a, in a king's, uh, in his kingdom, where he would sit on his throne in this area no one could come past. That's this picture of the sea of glass. However, these believers are pictured on the sea of glass, indicating full acceptance by God into his presence. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful scene. It's a wonderful scene. Then we saw these seven angels with these seven bowls of wrath, and then we saw God shut up 
in the temple. And remember who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Shut up into the temple because this thing is going to be so awesome and so, so awful, awesomely awful, uh, that God is, looks like he's contemplating what's going to happen here. He's in the temple alone. It's a somber scene. And you must realize the scope of what's going to take place. This is going to be global, total disaster. And again, the seal judgments were bad. The trumpet judgments were worse. But these are going to be the worst of the worst. There will be a rightful king that will come and reign. There will be. And you know his name. His name officially is the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no mistake, he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is how I think we should address him, although sometimes we're, we're very casual with them and call him Jesus, particularly me. But I, I, that is his official name. We see the command is given in verse 1. Watch this. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple, from the naos, the holy of holies. The vo- I think believe it's the voice of God saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of wrath of God on the earth. There is a finality with the bold judgments. Evil will be dealt with. You have no doubt about that. Please, we're living in an evil world where we see evil be called good and good called evil. Everything is turned upside down. It will be righted soon. The command comes from the temple, again, loud and clear, and it's God saying this. Remember, the temple, the holy of holy is closed. There's no cherubim there. There's no seraphim there. All the action has stopped. God is getting ready to pour out wrath on on planet earth. And remember, God loves and cares for his creation. He loves and cares for everyone that he's created. And he will not allow evil to reign forever. Evil will be stopped. Now, question for you. And I hope you have an answer to this question because I believe I mentioned this in the past. How does God deal with evil? Two ways. He either isolates it or he destroys it. No question about it. Evil can never be appeased. Oftentimes in the world, evil is tried to, we try to appease evil so it, so it doesn't come and bother me. Let's just throw a little bit of, of something at the evil to placate them, to appease them, just so it doesn't come and bother me. Evil will never be appeased. Evil, listen to this, always, always, always wants more and more. More and more all the time. An example of this in history was pre-World War II. It was called the Munich Pact. Most people don't remember this because most people aren't taught history anymore (laughs) in their schools. But in the spring of 1938, Hitler was a big deal. He was a big deal. And what he wanted to do, he wanted to annex part of Czechoslovakia, the part that was that, that, that contained the German-speaking people. It was called the Zudentan of Czechoslovakia. The Czechoslovakian government was adamantly opposed to this. They mobilized for war, but they knew that they were absolutely outmanned and outgunned by Hitler. And so they, were, they called for help from the British Prime Minister Chamberlain and from the French Prime Minister Daddy Lair. And they went on a mission on September 22nd to try to talk to Hitler and to make peace. And this is what happened. War seemed imminent. France became a, part, began a partial mobilization. Chamberlain and the French Prime Minister, Daddy Lair, who realized he was unprepared for the hostilities. The French Prime Minister wasn't at all involved with this. He wasn't all on board, but he knew they had to do something to stop Hitler. Chamberlain was a different story. He was on board with this. So they went and tried to appease Hitler. And they, they came away with what is called the Munich Pact, and Chamberlain flew, Chamberlain flew home to Britain, and he was welcomed as a hero because he stopped World War II from starting. He, they thought that they had appeased by giving this, this land away to, to Hitler, this little part of Czechoslovakia. It was called peace with honor, peace in our time. But you know what happened? In March 1939, Hitler annexed the rest of Czechoslovakia. Evil will never be appeased. Evil always wants more. On September 1st, 1939, evil expanded. 53 German army divisions invaded Poland. Evil will never be appeased. 
And after eight months of ineffectual worship, Chamberlain lost his place. And Winston Churchill came into power in Britain. You can never appease evil. Evil always wants more and more. Now listen, think about that in your life. We must not negotiate with evil in our life. Look, at it's never a little pot. It's never a little porn. It's never a little theft in the store, rationalizing like we've seen in our culture today. They have insurance. They have a lot of money. We can just bust in there and take whatever we want. Oh, no. Uh, there's never a little casino, a little fling, a little compromise. It's never just a little when you're dealing with evil. Evil always wants more and more, and evil will lie to you, get you addicted, get you used to what evil likes. Evil always wants your soul. That's what evil wants. How does God deal with evil? He isolates it, or he destroys it. He does not compromise it. He does not try to appease it. And these bold judgments are the final dealing with evil. Full strength, the full wrath of God, of interest, these judgments are very much like the Egyptian judgments. The Egyptian gods were being dealt with. Remember, Egypt is a picture of the world. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan. God wants us separate from the world, separate from Satan's stuff. He's going to deal with these earth dwellers. And there will be a time when evil will be isolated and we will be separated forever and protected from evil. God is, is repeating the judgments that he did on, in Egypt on a, on, a, on a global scale, not a local scale like in Egypt, but on a global scale, with the bold judgments, there is a final dealing with global evil. That's what you must realize. The first bowl is boils. Now just picture this. I, I don't know if you've ever had a boil in your life. But when I was going to college, and I was going to nursing school, I was under a lot of stress, having to work full-time, going to nursing school full-time, and that sort of thing. And I broke out with this staph infection of boils all over the place. And I thought, oh, I'm, this is another one of my I'm dying things. I'm dying. What's wrong with my immune system, Lord? But, you know, it, it was painful and it was miserable. Let's read about this. So the first one out, this is the first angel, and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Notice at the sore who it lands on. The believers are protected. Look, at and this time, there's not going to be any pretenders. It's pretending to believe in God. If you don't believe in God, guess what you get? A big old boil right on you, all over you, and you cannot be mistaken. The boils are painful, they're smelly, they're repulsive, they're ugly, and they're embarrassing. And as we go through this talk, remember, these boils are there through the whole bold judgments. I don't know how long these things last, but these people are miserable through this whole time. It's a picture for sure, in my mind, of hell's torment. God is so incredibly merciful. He doesn't want anybody to experience this, but these people have reached a point of no return. The second bold judgment, the sea turns to blood. Watch what happens with this. Verse 3. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. This is the salt water. And it became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. Now we just can just graze right past that, can't we? Just don't even give a second thought to it. But I'm telling you, this is a big deal. Every whale, every fish, every octopus, every porpoise, every shark... Every starfish, every turtle, everything in the sea, dead. Stone, cold, dead. And remember, 71% of the earth is the oceans. 71% of the earth is filled with blood from top to bottom. For 3 billion people on the planet, this is their major food supply. This is a huge hit. Now, we had a little picture of this in our lifetime of dead stuff on the sea. This happened in Russia for some reason. No one knew. All this dead stuff washed up upon the shore. The next picture is going to show you New uh, the, the, Mexi the Gulf of Mexico. All, these are all fish. You can't see this in this very well. But these all washed up on the shore. Dead, stone cold dead. Now what happens when you walk up on this? What's it going to smell like? Can you imagine that? 
All ocean food sources will be gone. Gone. All recreation, boat clubs, yachts, cruises, gone. There will be no place for the rich and the famous to escape to their little island of privacy, their little sanctuary, all gone. How does God deal with evil? He isolates it or he destroys it. The sight, the smell. The Egyptians experience this this blood on a local level. This will be a global level. A global level. The second trumpet, one third of the sea turned to blood. Now this is all the sea is blood. It's evidence that these judgments do not repeat themselves. And we do not recapitulate. Now there is a theory, and there comes a thing up here, the next screen, where these judgments repeat. The seal judgments are what the, what the judgments are, and the trumpets and the bold judgments, many people believe, are just descriptions of the same thing. And I would say, no, I believe that to be wrong. I believe in the next view that they telescope. They're telescoping. They're sequential. They're in order. We have the seal judgments. The seventh seal judgment releases the trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet releases the bowls. But remember, all these judgments are contained in the scroll. The seventh seal contains the trumpets and the bowl judgments. And it just gets worse and worse and worse for humanity on earth. Now remember Pharaoh again. Pharaoh was encouraged by God to let my people go. God was delivering his people from Satan's clutches, Pharaoh, in that system. God wants his people out of Egypt to come out and be separate. But this is different. This is different with these earth dwellers at this point. All the other judgments, the seal and the trumpets, God was still merciful, calling people out, calling people out. Turn and live. Turn and live. But there's a point when he says no more. These earth dwellers are sold out to Antichrist, hook, line, and sinker. And these are no longer encouraged by God to come out. They're past the point of no return. They've taken the mark of the beast. Now, I have a little cartoon here for you. And this is Satan and his minions fishing for humans. It doesn't matter if we catch them as long as they take the bait. Now, what does that mean? That means if these people have their eyes on the bait, Satan is trying to lure them in. They have their eyes off of the things of God onto the things of the world, and they are just waiting to be caught at some point. That is an interesting picture. They're waiting for for these people to take the bait. They've taken their eyes off of the things of God. Now listen to this. Thinking of 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9-11, through which we've been through many times, which describes the Antichrist coming onto the scene. We know that the Antichrist will come on with power, signs, and lying wonders. We know that will happen. We know that those who buy into the Antichrist spiel, who have taken the bait, will be those who refuse the love of the truth. That would be verse 10. The strong delusion uh, is, are the ones that have taken, have been fully in, 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 engrossed in what Satan has put out, what the Antichrist has put out. And the strong delusion was this, is that the Antichrist is the true Christ. And we'll get more into that in just a few minutes. The third bold judgment, the fresh water turns to blood. And now this is global. This is going to be verses 4 through 7. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers, the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard an angel of the waters. Isn't that something? There's an angel of the waters. That's that's designated to just deal with the waters. And notice what this angel says. You are righteous, O Lord, in what you're doing. The one who is and who was and who is to be because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. That's why it's happening to them. And you have given them blood to drink for it is their just due. And I heard another angel from the altar. The altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So, all the fresh water, all the rivers, all the springs, 
Everything is blood and you're wondering what is left to drink. Well, there's wells. Can you imagine the quick digging that is going on? Dig, 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 dig. Because they need fresh water. Now, why the blood? Well, we saw in verse 6 the reason why. Think of all the blood that the Antichrist and the earth dwellers have spilled during the tribulation period. The principle is this. The principle is this. You always reap later and you always reap greater than what you sow. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 9, that's our key verse. Be sure God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he shall also reap. If he sows to his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. If he sows to the Spirit, that's the saved part of you, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. All the blood, all the mass murder, and every believer and every Jew that remained loyal to Jehovah, to Yahweh, and refused the mark of the beast. Now, I want to suggest something to you. In, when you're doing a study of Revelation, there's a different views on when the rapture occurs and that sort of thing. And of course, my view, I feel fairly strongly it's a pre-tribulation rapture. But again, I always preface that. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But this is something to think about. The argument is, is that the Antichrist is pouring out his wrath in the beginning of the seal judgments. And I don't think that's a correct view. I think that he's pouring out, that he comes to power slowly. He ascends to power slowly. He comes on the white horse. And he doesn't reach his zenith of power until the middle of the tribulation. And when the, when the abomination of desolation is set up, he forces the worship of Antichrist, the taking of the mark, and whoever doesn't gets beheaded and they can't buy or sell. That is the real wrath of Antichrist, unequivocally. Unequivocally. I mean, the scripture is very clear on this. He, and millions will be killed by him. Antichrist starts out as a good guy. That's how he mesmerizes the world. He doesn't come on as this despotic leader. He comes on as a good guy. He's the world's answer man. He wants to hook you. He wants you to take the bait. And remember, Satan oftentimes masquerades as an angel of light, and that's how he will come on the scene. People will love him. He will love him, but he'll turn on people in the, in the middle of the tribulation. Remember, Satan is a liar, and Satan is a killer, a murderer. How do we know? John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, because there's no truth in him. When Satan speaks, when he speaks, he lies. He speaks his native language. For he is a liar and a father of lies. Satan is a liar. He is a murderer. And again, this judgment is on the earth dwellers. All the carnage will be on them. They all, and it's because of all the shed blood that has, been shed, that, has been, that has been perpetrated on the believers. It is their just due. And it should be noted that never forgotten, when we go through these things, what God has put up with over these years. He has been gracious. He has warned. He has drawn. He has told people that I am here. I am here. And these people are rejecting and rejecting. God is merciful and bears with long suffering the object of his wrath. And I want you to think of two people that give credence to this, this thought. Number one is Pharaoh. And the second one is Judas. Eventually God gave them what they desired. Ten times God goes to Pharaoh, or Moses goes to Pharaoh representing God, and deals with each one of Egypt's deity. He deals with the God of blood, frogs, lice, flies, locusts, hail, livestock, boils, darkness, death. I got all ten. That happens about 50% of the time. But anyway, those were the things. And Pharaoh six times hardened his heart. Would not change. Would not change. The last four times God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Gave him what he desired. Gave him what he desired. Now what about Judas? Do you think that Judas didn't have a lot of last, last chances? Dealing with Jesus. And we know that he did. Because at the last supper, Jesus offers Judas a special mark of honor when he offers him the sop or the bread. A mark of honor, a mark of friendship, and a mark of reconciliation. He offered this to Judas. It was a gesture of love. 
Judas received the bread. It was an outward show. An outward show. But refused the reconciliation. We see this in John 13, 26. What is reconciliation? Reconciliation is a big deal, theologically. The word is katalasso. Katalasso in the Greek. And it means this. God takes our sin on himself and establishes a relationship of peace with mankind. Peace with mankind. God has withdrawn his wrath. Most people don't want to deal with the wrath of God, but we must know that every single human born into this world is born into the kingdom of darkness and must be extracted from the kingdom of darkness, placed into the kingdom of light, in order for them to be saved and avoid the wrath of God. Now, the scripture that gives, I think, one of the greatest evidence of this is Romans chapter 5, verse 10. It says this, For if when we were enemies, that is a first class if, it means if it, it is so. It's not a third class if, which remains to be seen. This is a first class if. It is and is so. You were enemies with God. We were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. We were brought into right relationship with Father by the death of His Son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life, His resurrection. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. God's wrath has been removed and God's peace has been given to the believer. That is what reconciliation is. That is a very, very important concept. Again, all humanity is under the wrath of God and has to be rescued by the Lord Jesus to be saved. That's why Christianity, another reason why Christianity is the only true world religion. At least you're in the right camp, okay? If all the other world religions, you are not in the right camp. Now, the fourth judgment is going to be on the sun. And the sun is going to scorch the earth dwellers. Watch this, verses 8 through 9. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. And power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. This is heat. This is scorching. That is beyond your imagination. You know, if you go out to Phoenix in August, and you get in your car, you've got to have your little mittens on to grab hold of the steering wheel so you don't scorch your hands. Well, this is going to be, that's nothing compared to this. That's nothing compared to this. The fourth bowl will affect the sun. Now, let me suggest something to you. We hear a lot about global warming, climate change. The global warming pundits will finally be correct. There will be global warming. (laughs) But it won't be from carbon emissions. It won't be man-made global warming. (laughs) Man cannot undo what God has put into place. Have you ever heard of Greta Thunberg? She's a 15-year-old young girl who was very earnest in her beliefs, very sweet and that sort of thing, but she was really in, or is really in, to climate change. Climate change or global warming, they switched it from global warming to climate change because if you live in Michigan, we haven't seen global warming yet. It hasn't happened in Michigan yet. So global warming or climate change is the only acceptable science in our world today. Much contrary information is censored. You might get some leaked through, but most of it's censored. Anything that is contrary to that narrative. Those who have bought into the global warming narrative are oftentimes rabid and even look at it as a religion. They're worshiping, remember Gaia, Mother Earth. Mother Earth theology. Many of the global warming advocates or climate change are in abject fear that the planet is, planet is going to be destroyed, and in 10 years, the ice caps are going to melt, Florida is going to be underwater, the coasts are going to be flooded, and what has happened after 10 years? Florida is there, the coast is there. You know, there is, look at, 
if you believe in anything contrary to the narrative that is being put out, you are either censored, scorned, belittled, ostracized, looked at as ignorant, and dangerous. You are dangerous. You need to go to rethinking camp. Change your view. Now, most agree, I think most reasonable people will agree that temperatures do fluctuate. They do go up and they do come down. But the ice caps are still there. 30 years ago, they were warning us, weren't they? The ice caps are going to be melted. Again, they didn't melt. Now, why the climate change passion? You know why. If you've been here, you know exactly why. I believe it fuels the globalist agenda to unite under a one world government to save the planet. That is the scheme. Now, should we be good stewards of our earth? Absolutely. Should we clean up our environment? Absolutely. Should we live in fear and trembling that the world's going to end from climate change? Absolutely not. Is, was that unequivocal? Not, 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 no, no, no. Psalm 104.5 says this. Speaking of God, this is God. You who laid the foundations of the earth so that they will not be moved forever. Who laid the foundations of the earth? God. When will they be moved? They'll be there forever. They'll move when God wants to move them. Who will you believe? The global indoctrination? Your college professor? You go to college, you're going to hear this. Some scientist, Greta, the government? Are you going to believe God? I'll put my, I'll put my, my thoughts in God's camp. I'll, I'll, put my, I'll put my life in his hands. It's really that simple. Scripture tells us there will be global warming, but it won't be man-made, it'll be God-made. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and elements will melt with fervent heat. When they say elements... That's down to the atomic level. Okay, that's all new stuff coming. But the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Will there be global warming? Yes, there'll be global warming. Will it be man-made? It's not man-made. It'll be God-made. Revelation 21.1 speaks of the day of God. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. That word new is kainos. doesn't mean anything to you, but it's very important. Because it means it's qualitatively new. It's not a renewed earth. There are many Christians that believe that God is going to renew the earth. Simply fix what was broken. Oh no, it's going to be totally new. Down to the elements. Down to the elements. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and there was no more sea. In eternity, this is Revelation 21, everything will be new. Everything will be new. A new order of things. Please do not miss this. The posture of the earth dwellers experiencing this global warming, this scorching, in spite of their misery, they blaspheme the name of God, speak evil of God, speak against his reputation. They did not repent and they refused. They did not give him glory. That's what they did. This is the hardest of hardest hearts, folks. Just like Pharaoh's heart confirmed in their unbelief and their hatred for the true God. How sad. This is the peak of delusion. They have bought in hook, line, and sinker to the strong delusion we mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2.11. Now, in the past, I've mentioned the Luciferian doctrine. You are familiar with this. I've mentioned it just a few seconds ago, but I haven't categorized it at this, that the Antichrist is the true Christ. This is the Luciferian doctrine that will permeate our world at the end. Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Folks, that is the strong delusion. How easily, now think about this, how easily mankind accepts the counterfeit. How easily they take the false for the true, the false Christ for the true Christ, the make-believe Jesus for the real Jesus, the counterfeit false religious system for the, for the real ways of God. The counterfeit humanist saying there is no God. The counterfeit tares. Remember the wheat and the tares? The wheat of the true believers. The tares look just like the wheat until the harvest. Until the harvest. The false converts. Mesmerized by the world. Worship the God of their imagination. All replacing the true God 
was some greatly inferior counterfeit. I can't imagine why people do that. Something that looks good, smells good, tastes good, but is poison to your soul and will kill you. And most people don't even know that they're being deceived by the master deceiver. They have, they have been, been conned by the master con man. They've rejected the true for the false, and how sad is that? And finally, the fifth bold judgment is darkness and pain, verses 10 through 11. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues. That's not a pretty picture, is it? They gnawed their tongues because of the pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. Now look, at, let me just ask you a question. When I had my first boil pop up, what do you think I did? I ran to Chris and says, please help me with this thing. I, that was the first thing. But even, very soon after that, I'm going, God, God, I need help, God, I need help. That would be the sensible thing to do. These people are blaspheming God. The only one that can help them, they continue to blaspheme. From excruciating boils, water turned to blood that smelled like death, blindness, darkness that could be felt. Remember, the Egyptians felt that in Exodus 10, 21. These people are in abject misery. And what do these hard hearts do? The most amazing of amazing things. They continue to blaspheme God. We hate you. We, we hate you. We, you won't rule over us and refuse to repent of their deeds. This is the epitome of human depravity, of human arrogance, and human rebellion. Many today say this. And I bet you you've run into this. I bet you have. If only I would believe there was a God if I could touch him. If I could just hear him. If I could just see him. I would believe. If I could just see a miracle, that's when I would believe. You know what? Jesus walked this earth. They saw him. They touched him. They heard him. Jesus is Emmanuel. God with us. God in human form. Jesus did miracles. And how many followed Jesus before the cross? They all ran away. And just a few were left. The earth dwellers, when confronted with catastrophe, the known judgments of God, did not repent, and their blasphemy is deep. And this is, this is mind-blowing. And their evil purposes accentuated. Now, oh, good question for us. Process this. What in the world is humanity's problem? What is humanity's problem? <laughs> yeah. Like Pharaoh, they are hardened and they are committed to plunging into the abyss of their own desires. I want my way. In the end, the cry will be of the lost world, we will not have you rule over us. Isn't that astounding? Isn't that astounding? Now closing, the first five bold judgments. Remember this, God judges and death will come. And death is a finality, folks. When you pass, you better left it all on the field. You want this left all on the field. You want to give all your best and your greatest. This is your time. You are in the game right now. You have been handed the ball, and now your time to bust through the line. This is your moment. Time passes so quickly. Time passes so quickly. There is simply a time to believe, and there is a time that people reject. That is called your life. My dad came into this world on August the 5th, 1924. And there's a dash, and he exited this world on February 6th, 2021. His life was between that dash, and he had a long dash compared to a lot of people. What you do is predicated, is only can be done on that dash. Nothing happens after this that you can do. Everything has to be done here and now. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 tell us the following. And we've been to this scripture many times. You are familiar with this. 
but bear with me. God chooses a time of salvation. Humans don't do this. Humans oftentimes say this, I, I'm just not ready. Now, I'm not ready now. I will re readdress this some other time. You have no idea. Death is certain. Death is unknown. Death comes to each one of us, and it comes at different times. Some very short, some very long, but it'll come to every one of us. Unless we're raptured. Listen to what Paul says. When we then, as workers together with him, that means we are working in concert with God to give the salvation message to humanity. He uses us in this process. We as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. That word vain is kinos. It means empty. It means useless. Don't thwart the grace of God. Now look, I believe the grace of God appears to everybody. Why do I believe that? Because Titus 2.11 says, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to every person, every human being. Comes, God comes to us. In an acceptable time, I have heard you. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. Remember, there's a day. There's a day that God deals with each one of us. That's his time. Now I'm very thankful that it was a day that was lots of days in my life. Okay, this day, this day, this day. He was gracious. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The moral of the story is this. Don't put off today to get your way to do what you want, thinking that you're going to escape at the last second and raise your hand and say, I'm in, Lord, I'm in. You don't know. You do not know. And you don't not know if your heart will be hardened like Pharaoh's, and like Judas. This is your time. This is your time. If you feel the Holy Spirit dealing with you, this is your moment. I continue to be astounded, and I bet you are too, that God, who was so majestic, so awesome and amazing in his power, in his intellect, in his vastness, would choose to love me. Put your name there. Put your name there. Choose to love you. God's omnipresence, remember we talked about that last time, was mind-blowing. That God is all over. A hundred thousand light years from now, God. Depths, God. Wherever you go, God. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. But yet, He loves me. That is an astounding thing to me. That Jesus came and died for me. It's personal. He died for me. He came here for me. You put your name there. Yet mankind's resistance to God is also mind-blowing. What is mankind's problem? John 3.19 answers that question. This is the condemnation. That light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Pharaoh loved the darkness. Judas loved the darkness. Humanity today, the vastness of humanity, loves the darkness. Remember, there's only going to be a few that enter the narrow gate. How do I know? Because Jesus said so. <laughs> and the Bible says so. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many go in by it. And narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. The vast majority are deceived. The vast majority are seeking their own way. If God is dealing with you, this is your time to know the truth. How do humans demonstrate love for the darkness? You ever wonder that? Think about this. I will control my life. I will control my destiny. And I will rule and reign as I please over my life. This is my life. Remember the song? I can't do it as good as Don, but I mean, you had such a good voice, Don. That was great. It's my life. Well, I can't even do it like, the, like, these, like these guys did. I think it was the animals, wasn't it? It's my life, and I do what I want. And you just feel the mm coming out of it, you know? Yeah. Hey, I got, a, I got an applause. That's my first applause. Yes, thank you. Usually it's stop, stop. Yes. You've heard this poem many times from me. 
And it's the hu- it describes the human condition to a T. It's er- William Ernest Henley's Invictus. You know what Invictus means? And it's, a, it, it, it's a Latin word that means invincible. That I'm invincible. Humanity is invincible. And I'll read this to you. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be. You know where this guy's at. For my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winched nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms the horror of the shade. He's talking about the grave. That's, that's, that's symbolic of the grave. And yet the menace of the years finds, finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate is crescendoing, how charged the, with punishments the scroll. You can almost hear the crowd cheering. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And nothing could be farther from the truth. Please. John Bloom comments on this poem, and he says, quote, Invictus is decent poetry, but as a declaration of cosmic independence, it is frankly a delusional fantasy. The poem is more like a metaphysical temper tantrum. No one is going to be the boss of me. And then he says this, if you like your Invictus with a little more schmaltz, a little more melodrama, try Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. I can honestly say, and I can say this, and hopefully you can too, that I do not want my way. I have, I've learned something in life, and I learned this, that I do not want it my way. Because my way will be the dark way. What does mankind need? A Savior. What does God do? He gives mankind what mankind needs. He gives them a Savior. Now please hear this. When you're thinking about salvation, and this is the most important thing that you can think about, because you were here to have a relationship, that dash between your entrance and exit point, have a relationship with God. It only happens through Jesus Christ. No other way. But remember this. We're all blinded. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of Christ. So what do we need? God opens blind eyes. It is God. God softens hard hearts. God draws. John 6.44, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. But God convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's the Holy Spirit's job in John 16.8. God is constantly at work in the hearts of humanity. God sent his only begotten Son to die for our sins, to take the wrath of God that I deserve. God did that. It's all a work of God. It is not a work of humanity. Our job, and you've been here a long time, most of you, you know what your job is, to believe and receive the gift. There are some in Christendom that say that's works. And I say to you, no, that is not works. God is offering you a free gift. Take the gift, David. Take the gift. Did you work for that, David? Did you do anything for that gift? No, you didn't. Yeah, You had a free gift. It is not works. God did all the works. And think about this. The judgments that we have studied are real. They are coming. And they are warning everyone who reads this book of Revelation. It is a blessing to read this book. Turn and live. Live for the Master. It is worth it. It is worth it to give your life to the King. This is ending, folks. If you haven't noticed, you're getting gray hair. Look in the mirror. I saw my my nephew the other at, at the funeral, and I said, Josh, you're getting gray hair. Welcome to the club, Josh. Welcome to the club. You're getting old. Are you feeling it, Josh? He says, yes, I am. I says, that's right. You're 40 years old. And I'm thinking, gosh, 40, that'd be so great. (laughs) We need to take God seriously while we have life. Some things to know. God is real. Deal with it. He's real. God is close. God cares for you intimately. Intimately. God sent His Son to die for you. Make it personal. And God is not far from each one of us. In Acts chapter 17, verse 27 through 28, 
Paul says this. And this is after he was on Mars Hill. And he's a little bit discouraged because he didn't make a lot of success with those Greeks on Mars Hill. But he says this, that they should seek the Lord in the hope that we might grope for him and find him because he is not far from each one of us. Oh, God is close. He just wants you to just turn your eyes on Jesus. Just look at Jesus. Just take him in as your Savior. For in him we live and move and have our being. God, folks, is a life giver. He is. He is a life giver. He desires that all be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And God, listen to this, above all, while you're on this pilgrimage, God is a hope giver. God is a hope giver. We have hope that the world does not have. Today, light and darkness are set before you. And I would plead with you, choose the light. Come to the light. Remember, Jesus is the light. John 1, 9, the true light that gives light to every man coming into the world. That's our Savior. I want to close with you with the Christian Invictus poem. It goes like this. Dorothea Day wrote it, and it's called My Captain. Remember, Invictus means invincible. And you who are in Christ are invincible. You belong to the King. Your power comes from Him. Out of the light that dazzles me, bright as the sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I know to be for Christ, the conqueror of my soul. What a difference. I have no fear, though straight the gate. He cleared from punishment the scroll. He's declared me righteous the moment I believed in Jesus. Christ is the master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. And I can just say yes, yes, yes. Thank you. This life is not about me. See, we think it's all about us because that's what the world tells us. Be true to yourself. Treat yourself good. It's all about you. No, it isn't. It's about you following the king and becoming a servant of the master. Life is all about, it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. And folks, I hope that you can say, he is the captain of your soul. I hope you can say that. Yes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. And, and Lord, I'm so gracious and grateful. That, I'm grateful that you're gracious. I'm grateful that you have saved us. I'm grateful that there was a day that you took the blinders off my eyes and you gave me the ability to believe this message. And I say, thank you, Father, for the gift of your son. Thank you for all of these warnings that we are getting in the book of Revelation. Thank you that we, don't not, we will not take life for granted, for we know it is a gift from you, that you have declared when we will come in, you have declared the length of our dash, and you have declared the moment of our exit. All the days ordained for me were given before one of them came to be. And I don't, know, I don't know what that is. But while I'm here, I pray that each person in this room can get a real vision and a real purpose for their lives and why they were made. And it is not to become rich and it is not to become famous, but it is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He is worthy of everything. Thank you for this teaching today. Thank you, Lord, that after these bold judgments, the king will come. And maybe next week we'll see the campaign of Armageddon and just how Jesus will do this. Lord, right now, if there's someone in this room that has pretended to be a Christian, maybe this is their time that they'll say, no, no more pretending. This is my time. The Spirit of God is speaking heavy to me. I will believe and receive the gift of salvation. It's just that simple. Believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Admit that you're a sinner and that he takes your sin debt and that Jesus will take all of your wrath and you will be reconciled to God. Thank you for this time together. Lord, please do the work that needs to be done in the hearts of each person here. In Jesus' name, amen.